Thank you. You may be you may be seated. I'm going to have Juan Carlos and uh, Maggie uh, stand there in the back, and uh, they have um, come to partner uh, with our church, and uh, we've had a wonderful time getting to know them, and uh, just the the way that God desire, desires and really has designed them to to minister and to bless our church. But they've both been saved and scripturally baptized by immersion, and so if I can get a uh, first for uh, membership here, we got Fernando and a second. Can I get a second? Ron, all in favor, say amen. 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 Welcome to the family. You may be seated. Uh, We are, uh, we're excited uh, for uh, what the uh, Lord has uh, in store uh, for for you all uh, here at the church. Uh, You can tell Juan Carlos has already been singing. He's the one that is the really, really high one. I assure you that is not me, okay? That is uh, him. Matthew chapter number 13, Matthew 13, and uh, I'm glad that you're here. Uh, today and uh, as I say always when I get to fill in for Mike it makes me more thankful for him and for his ministry uh, to our church I think he uh, his flights were so delayed you know uh, coming across country but uh, I think he is here and uh, I'll make sure that I uh, face to face tell him how thankful I am for him but this is kind of more my comfort zone and so I'm excited to get into uh, the the word here uh, this morning. We've been in our series for the last just couple weeks, kind of launched out of First Peter just for a few weeks, and we've entitled it Sustaining Service. Sustaining Service. And so we, we started off with expectations. Uh, what should our expectations be as we are vessels that God wants to use? As you are being used, there's all different types of soils. There are, uh, you know, rocky soils. There are soils that, you know, get choked up with weeds. There's the good soil. And there's some that does, they don't even get into the ground at all um, because the uh, birds come and pick them off the ground. But, and then last week, we saw that in that good ground, in that good soil, there's also going to come weeds. And Jesus is planting, as well as his enemy, the devil, and there's going to be weeds. But so now we come to a few more parables, and we're going to kind of move from kind of expectations, limitations, to now the good stuff. We're kind of getting into the good stuff, the progress. Let's notice the progress. Verse number 31, another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds, but when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs and becometh a tree, so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. Another parable spake he unto them, the kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in the three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. So today we come to the parable of the mustard seed, it's that, it's that tiny seed that grows into a blossoming tree. And then the parable of the leaven, that is kind of the, the yeast, uh, would be kind of what we more understand, that it permeates the whole, the whole batch of dough is what that second parable is about. And so these parables... These specific to the mustard seed as well as the, uh, the parable of the leaven getting into all of the dough, it's understood in very, very different ways. And as I was thinking about this, I kind of was reminded of the story of Goldilocks and the three bears. She was, out in the, she was out in the forest, and she comes upon a house of the three bears. There's no one home. She goes inside, and there's three bowls of, uh, of soup there. Of porridge and one is too hot one is too cold and one is just right and so she enjoys all of that uh, bowl of porridge and so the three ways that these parables have been understood can be described as too hot too cold and just right and we're gonna look at all three of them we're gonna look at the too hot the too cold and hopefully when we come to the just right, just the, just the right interpretation of the text, we really will want to eat it all up. So let's start with the too hot perspective of this text, and that would be a prophecy of unrivaled success, that it's just going to be just complete success. 
Some Christians have understood these parables to mean that the world will get better and better and better as the gospel spreads and that the world becomes increasingly brought under Christ's influence that evil will subside and it will become better and better. And just as the leaven, in a sense, leavens the whole lump of dough, so the whole world will ultimately be changed by the gospel. Now, there's definitely some truth uh, to that. The expansion of the gospel across the world has been seen with remarkable uh, success in terms of evangelism, discipleship, education, reform, medical reform, hospitals that, that kind of came through as the gospel spread around the globe, prison reform, and on and on and on. But it's not been unrivaled success. See, the problem with understanding uh, what lies in the parable that we look at is last week. Because last week, even in the good soils, we're trying to, to do right. Jesus is telling us, hey, hey, I am the sower in the second parable there. I'm the sower. The field is the world. I'm sowing good seed into good ground. Oh, by the way, I've got an enemy. He's going to sow some weeds and some nasty things, and they're going to grow up. And as we learned last week, we're to actually let those grow together until the harvest. And so we see that until Christ returns, it's going to be hard There's going to be this good and evil, and they're going to both, we saw last week, they're both going to grow. So if they're both going to grow, then that means they're both going to advance until we see Christ return. And so that brings us to an important principle that I want us to kind of think about when it comes to looking at Scripture, when it comes to interpreting Scripture, and that is this, always understand Scripture in light of other Scripture. That is a good principle that you should have. When you're going into into a text and you're reading that text, don't just let what it says jump off the pages without understanding also other Scriptures. So we believe that God has spoken, that the whole of the Bible is the Word of God. God does not contradict Himself. So we must not interpret one part of the Bible in a way that would directly contradict another. And so in the parable of the wheat and the weeds from last week, the Lord tells us quite clearly that there will be evil reigning. Does it look like evil's reigning right now in some places in our world? Yes, it does. And Jesus told us it was going to happen. It should it, it, it should alarm us. It should, it should humble us. It should break us. We should mourn. We should weep, right? Rejoice with them that rejoice. Weep with those that weep. But Christians shouldn't be shocked because Jesus said that this was going to happen. So we've got to realize that we can't look at it and be too optimistic that, that, that these are just teaching just this amazing growth and it's going to be... Um, you know, unrestricted. So that'd be the too hot. Now let's kind of taste it a little bit too cold. And that would be that we would look at these two parables of the mustard seed and the leaven, and that we would see it as a warning of relentless decline. Okay, so when it's too hot, it's just going to keep exploding and it cannot be restrained. But if it's too cold, then this is a, this is a warning that it's going to constantly be in decline. The, they, they, they come to this because they, they point out that leaven is often used in the Bible as a symbol of evil, right? Jesus even said, hey, you need to watch out for the leaven of the Pharisees in Matthew chapter number 16. He says you need, you, you need to be aware of them, of, of that leaven that just kind of it permeates the Sadducees as well as the Pharisees. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, he says, You need to purge out. You need to get rid of the old leaven. You need to make room for this new leaven, this new lump, all right? And so they take texts like that amongst others, and they point out also that the birds that the Lord says here that are kind of, they're going to make nests, right, in this mustard seed that blossoms up, (coughs) excuse me, into... Uh, a tree. They point out this great 
picture of beauty, but in the parable of the sower, the birds are the ones that take away the seed, right, that's sown along the pathway. That was kind of the first one that we looked at a couple weeks ago. And so they see this as, all right, there's birds, and they take away the seed. So instead of understanding these parables as a prophecy of growth and of success, these Christians understand the parables to be a warning of corruption and decline. So in this view, in this way of interpreting this, Jesus is warning the disciples that the truth will be compromised, that godliness will be corrupted, and the church will become this nesting place for birds, that is, that will take over and the people will remove the word of God out of churches. Are we seeing that some? For sure. And so there's for certain application to some of these views. G. Campbell Morgan, he wrote in 1943 in the parables and the metaphors of our Lord, he says this, the popular conception of this particular parable is that our Lord predicts the great success of the kingdom. That will view, however, has been that view, however, has been distinctly disproved by history. There has been growth, but it has been unsatisfactory. We thought that it would have been so different, that the kingdom principles were winning. We thought that was so with a certain measure of arrogance at the close of the 19th century and on into the 20th. Then, like the crack of doom, we found the kingdom ideal rejected by the philosophers of earth and the earth bathed in blood and muck and war. So now again, you can see that there is some truth that is being said, that, 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 that what is being said. Too often the church has lost its grasp on truth. For sure it has. But Jesus is teaching here not primarily about the church. If you remember, with each one of these, Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like and then he goes into his different parables and so when you when, when you look at the church for sure you can study the history of the church and it's undeniable that that there has been a relinquishing of truth but that's not necessarily what jesus is teaching here this is about the kingdom of heaven and what is the kingdom of heaven we learned last week that it is the rule of the almighty so what does the rule of god look like in the world well, the reign of Christ is not a story of failure. The reign of Christ is not at all a story of decline. And so here comes a second principle that I want you to understand when we're, when we're trying to interpret Scripture. The first one was you've always got to understand Scripture in light of its whole, in light of the entire, the entire picture. Secondly, and a gentleman and I were literally talking about this yesterday in my office. Always understand Scripture in its context. In its context. So, for example, if I were to ask you what the serpent stands for in the Bible, what's the first answer that comes to your mind? You just think about that. And I think of serpent, we think of Genesis 3, right? 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 That, that's normally what, what, what comes to our mind is, is Genesis 3, that, that, that sneaky snake, the devil, and he comes into the garden to destroy everything that God was doing. But in Numbers, you have a story of a serpent in the wilderness, right? And Moses, he puts a snake on a pole, and, he, and, and everyone who looked at it was healed from the snake bites. And in John's gospel, this story is used as a metaphor to speak of Christ as he is lifted up on the cross before us. So it's context. It's context, context, context that determines its meaning. We become very, it's very, very dangerous just to go like this, pull out a verse, and then be like, okay, I'm going to live by that and take it with, with not within its context. I think there's all kinds of extremes, and if you allow me just to put religion, because some of those things happen. They'll go to, they'll go to one verse, and they like certain words that are in that verse, and then they're going to like make a whole ministry just kind of out of those words. And so let's be, let's be careful with that. So the fact that leaven 
indicates something bad else in the Bible does not necessarily it means that it has the same meaning here. In this story, Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like leaven. The kingdom of heaven is the rule and it is the reign of God and that can only ever be good. Okay? So, too hot is, it's just the gospel's going to explode and there's going to be no adversaries against it. And then the too cold is, is that no matter how hard we try, the things are just going to get worse and worse and worse and worse and worse and ultimately just Jesus call us home. What about just right? Just like Goldilocks comes in there like, ooh, that's too hot, that's too cold. Ooh, I like this one. So let's, let's look at what I believe is a just right type of interpretation of this text. And that would be this, a promise of sustained progress. Sustained progress. I want you to put yourself in the shoes, do your best, of the first disciples. Try to, try to imagine you're there and you are hearing Jesus teaching these parables. We've, if we've grown up in church any length of time, you've read them over and over again. You've had maybe, uh, uh, you know, people try to interpret them and I understand that parables are sometimes difficult and I don't claim to be the expert in any way on them. But put yourself in the early disciples' shoes, listening to them. And so Jesus, he comes along and says, and he says, we are to be sowers of the word, and I'm going to be sowers with you. And so you, you, Jesus, you're telling us that when we sow the seed, the devil's going to snatch some of it away. Trouble and persecution is going to come, and those that received it gladly, yay, they're going to drift away. Our, measure, our message is going to have to compete for space in the lives of people who are already overloaded. They haven't, they've got the, the cares of this world earlier in this chapter talks about, who their hopes and their dreams are already set on things of this world, and it's going to get choked out, our message. And on top of that, when we actually hit some good soil... You're telling me that the devil's going to also come in there and plant some weeds and and wreak havoc in my beautifully uh, garden? You want to commit your lives to that? What chance do we have? How in the world are we going to sustain a, a lifetime of service with all of that that is against us? I want you to think of what you would be hearing from Jesus And so to answer that question, Jesus, I believe, gives us these two parables. And these two parables are a promise of sustained progress. And this progress comes in two different ways. It comes in visible growth and pervasive influence comes in visible growth, and that is the kind of how the gospel works in the world. Look at verse number 31. The kingdom of heaven, towards the end of verse 31, sorry, the kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed which a man took and sowed in his field. Now here's what the rule of Christ looks like in the, in the world. It's like, a, it's like a tiny seed. Jesus says it's it's the smallest of the seeds. This would have certainly been the smallest of seeds in any Palestinian garden of that day. And then it says, and then when it's grown and when it gets larger than all of the other garden plants, he says it's going to be like a mighty, awesome tree. So Jesus' kingdom, it has a small beginning, but it leads out to a great and glorious outcome. I want you to think about how the gospel began to spread in the world at the beginning. Our Savior, he was born very poor in this world, right? Into a manger, and you can, you can kind of think of all of the ramifications of that. He was ultimately then, um, didn't really have a pillow to lay his head. He didn't have a, a home when he started his ministry. He's just, he's wandering and preaching. He's put to death beside two criminals, right, on a cross. 
And after that, about 120 fearfully, fearful people remained, but they were his followers. They're meeting in prayer in the upper room. His first preachers <laughs> were fishermen and publicans who, for the most part, they weren't very educated. They were rather unskilled in this type of, of proclaiming the truth. The first truth that they preached was a cross, which was a stumbling block to the Jews and an offense to the Gentiles. I got those mixed up. Sorry about that. An offense to the Jews, stumbling block to the Gentiles. That was their first message. The first message was the cross. And so the, like, literally people would have not necessarily even wanted to hear that. Foolishness. Stumbling block to the Jews, sorry, and foolishness to the Gentiles. The first movements of faith brought persecution, first on the leaders and them that followed. The Christian faith began as a tiny grain of a mustard seed, but the seed had life in it. And from these small beginnings, the gospel spreads. As the gospel has been preached, the risen Christ is laying claim to more and more and to more people's lives. We could talk about at length about how the gospel began to spread through the Roman Empire and then through Europe and India and Africa and Asia and around the world. What is Jesus Christ doing in the world? He's drawing people to himself. He is sustaining them in faith. He is taking them home, ultimately, into his presence. I want you to think about this. The Church of Jesus Christ is the only organization on earth that has never lost a member through death because every single death is simply a fulfillment of the gospel. You trust Christ. He saves you. We die. We get promoted, right? Up to heaven. Any, uh, a, another member of the body of Christ becomes safely home. And so the Bible gives us a glimpse of what Christ's kingdom will look like in the future. Revelation 7 says, In this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which nobody could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, and they were stood before the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed with white robes and palms in their hands and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sit upon the throne and unto the Lamb. Now, how is this going to happen? We'll never be discouraged that, that a work is small if Christ is at its center. See, the kingdom of God is like a tiny little mustard seed. It may be small now, but it is part of something glorious that will last forever. It might be small now, but at some point it's going to grow all beyond all of the other herbs and all of the other shrubs in the garden to a place now where it is a mighty, massive oak. And that day is happening and it is going to continue to happen. Romans 1 verse 16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And so there's this, there's this visible growth. You can see it, visible growth. But then there's also this pervasive influence. And this is what happens in the believer. So let's look again. Verse number 33. And another parable spake he unto them, the kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in the three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. We've been looking at what the kingdom of heaven looks like in the world for a moment. Now, what does it look like in the individual believer? If you've ever made your own bread, you know all about this, right? Leaven is like yeast, okay? And it produces it fermentation in the dough, causing it to rise when it is baked, Every time bread was made, a piece of that leavened dough was put into storage. When the next batch of dough was made, the leavened dough was mixed into it, causing the next one to rise over and over again. Listen to what John MacArthur says in his commentary on Matthew. When a Jewish girl was married, her mother would give her a small piece of leavened dough from a batch baked just before the wedding. From the gift of leaven, the bride would bake bread for her own husband throughout her married life. Why? Because it is a living organism. It keeps right on living and living and spreading. So Jesus, what he's teaching us here, he's saying that, that, that a small amount 
of the leaven mixed into a batch of dough will permeate the whole group of the, the, the dough. Kind of, it changes its entire nature. Bake it with leaven or without, it's hard and crispy and flat. You put leaven within it, it's light, fluffy, delicious, and good, and we all want to eat that kind of bread. So think about this relationship in your experience as a Christian. When God's grace entered into your heart, it's like a little leaven. And then what God does is over the course of that time, it begins to be mixed in and through your life. Now think about how that began. You began maybe to, to feel an awakening to, to spiritual things at, at some point in your life. Maybe there was a dissatisfaction of your own life or maybe a life that was in you, uh, someone around you. You saw something in Christ that began to draw you to him. Perhaps this is happening right now in your life. I can't necessarily see your heart and where you stand with God, but he's, he's drawing you. He uses his word. He uses the Holy Spirit. You begin to read the Bible and pray, and at some point you trusted Jesus Christ is your Savior. For me, that was 1992. I was 12 years old. God had been drawing me for some time, and then I yielded and submitted and trusted Christ as my Savior. So God began a work of grace in your heart, and gradually what he began in you penetrates the whole of your life. God's grace begins to influence your conscience. It begins to influence your affections. It begins to influence your mind and your actions, the the, the way that you live your life. It changes your nature from the inside out. Starts with just a little. God places that in there. He places a spirit within you, right? And it begins, hopefully, just ultimately begins to grow. And so here's what the rule of Christ looks like in the life of a believer. Hear me. It goes everywhere. No part of the dough is unaffected. No part of the life is unaffected. He wants it all. His rule in you. So, king, you know, as it is in heaven, here on earth, right? His rule should dominate your life. The way you think to the actions to everything. The kingdom of heaven is like this. The rule of Christ in the life of a believer may have a small beginning. It may be really small right now in your life. Trust me, this message is not a judgment on you, but at some point it is going to bring complete transformation. What did Paul say? Paul said, I want you to be confident. I want you to be confident of this very thing. He, speaking of God, began a good work in you and he will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So he begins it as salvation. It, you, you begin to change. You become a new creature, right? Old things are passed away. All things are become new. And you begin this process of what we would call sanctification, where the rule of God is leading in your life and in my life and all of the different crevices. No, 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 God, you can't have this part. That's not the will of God in your life. The kingdom of heaven needs to have full rule in everything, just like leaven ends up permeating the entire lump of dough. So I want to encourage you to never lose hope. 2021, 2020, 2021, it's been tough. It's been a rough year trying to minister for God. But as we minister to God, we've got to understand, got to understand the expectations. The proper expectations are, as you say, God, I'm a conduit, you use me. Like 25% of it's good. 75% of it's no good. 
And so when we come to that understanding of, of proper expectations, that even when we find something good, when we find good soil and God, you're using my life, you got to understand that, 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 that Satan is going to be planting some weeds in there as well comes back to expectations there are some limitations but let me encourage you there is there is progress you continue god continue to use me when christ appears we will be like him for we will see him as he is see when you become a christian you begin to see how far you are from what god is calling you to be but there's a new longing in your life to live for holiness. Sometimes all you can see is how far you fall short. Satan keeps saying to you, look at where you were. But Jesus keeps saying to you, look at where you will be. There is going to be progress. You are not conformed yet completely to the image of Christ. But the leaven of Christ, it's present in your life. If you know Jesus Christ is your Savior, His grace will permeate every single part of your life. The entire, if you allow me to put it this way, the entire dough of your life will ultimately be Christ like. The nature of every part of you, soul and body, will be changed. And the day is coming when you will be like Christ. So stay encouraged. Continue the plotting. Continue to sow. Continue to be vessels. God, use me for your honor and for your glory because there is going to be progress. When we have this hope within us, we ought to purify ourselves even as Christ is pure. Now listen, none of us are there yet. Right now, all of us, including me, we are mass we're a mass of contradictions. We love Christ, for sure, yet at some time we feel the pull of the world. Sometimes we behave in a way that grieve the Lord. We trust Christ, yet at the same time we're subject to all kinds of doubts and fears in this world. We have resurrection life within us, yet at the same time our bodies are subject to weakness and decay and death. But my friends, the day is coming when you will love God with all of your heart and soul and mind and strength. That day is coming. So, hey, child of God, lift up your head. It's coming. There is progress. I believe Jesus, he's he's talked about some, honestly, some negative stuff in these these parables. A lot of it's going to seem like nothing's happening. And even where you're planting the good stuff, Weeds are going to come in. Why would I sign up for that? Because as you do, there is progress. That little small mustard seed, right? A faith, that that seed that you're planting there, it blossoms into something that is awesome and powerful. That leaven, that yeast, will ultimately permeate through your life and through my life. At some point, you're going to fully love your neighbor as yourself. Right now it's hard, isn't it? But that's what we're commanded to do. Love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We don't do that perfectly. Jesus does. Jesus did. We get that imputed to our account. That's our standing before God. But someday it's actually going to be a reality. We're going to love our neighbor as ourselves. Someday that will become a reality. Temptation, pain, disappointment, all of it is going to be distant memories. When's that going to be? There's coming a day. There's coming a day. We sang about it. What a day that will be. Your gifts will be fully developed in the service of God. God will wipe every single one of your tears away. But until then, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And so Jesus, he takes these very common illustrations to the early listeners and he's sharing a parable and he's saying hey your life of service it's like a mustard seed you're just planting sometimes the smallest grain in the palestinian garden at the time the smallest grain of a mustard seed and it blossoms into a mighty tree but you know what it takes it takes time it takes time your service takes time sometimes you don't always see the results you want stick at it Why? Because God blesses it. 
And then you as a believer, man, I'm a walking contradiction. I, I know. But at some point, we're no longer going to be. And as, as we sanctify, as we get more and more like Christ, hopefully those contradictions become less and less. But the reality is, is that we're marching actively towards a wonderful, wonderful reunion with Christ where we will indeed be like him. Why? Because God started the work now. But you can be confident, he says, that he's going to perform it all the way until the day of Jesus Christ. Progress. Can't wait till next week. I wish I could preach it right now. Joy. Joy. You continue down. Read the next, read the next parables this week. And you're going to see the pearl of great price and the joy that comes into that. But we've got to be willing to sow. Got to be willing. Keep sowing. Keep sowing. Keep, God, use me in the way that he has created you. And I promise you there will be progress. And then we'll learn about the, the reaping and the joy that comes in the next time we are in this text. Every head bowed, every eye closed.